healing, salvation, and happiness. It's your season. It's your time. God has plans for your life to prosper you and to give you hope and a future. Join us and learn how God's love and power can bring hope and happiness to your life. This is your opportunity for motivation, encouragement, and purpose. Welcome church family. It's Megan Reed with another great segment of the Daily Gospel Network, where we bring you the Word of God and soul-stirring encouragement from churches, pastors, and choirs from all over the country. And today is no different. Check out this inspiring sermon from one of the church community's most dynamic pastors. Hey, what's up? Welcome to Walk in the Word with Benevolent Faith Ministries. This is the show where we provide biblical interpretation that engages the word to the text, the context behind the text, and the application for us all, my friends, beyond the text. And today, y'all, today we have another very special show with a very special guest. And as many of us who work and operate within the church realm will tell you, the kingdom is sorely in need of more godly, dedicated men to carry out the Lord's will, not just in the church, but also in the world. Yeah. And see, the work that women do is highly valuable and necessary. Don't get me wrong. But that work should be complemented by and actually influenced by the models, the examples set by men in the kingdom and in the church. But how can men most effectively be all that God needs for them to be if they don't know how, if they're not equipped, if they have no idea where to even start? Where do men go to find the spiritual freedom necessary to commit ourselves wholly and fully to the Lord? Well, friends, since being founded in the year 2000, the goal of every man ministries has been to, quote, revolutionize men's ministry, free men spiritually, and ignite spiritual health worldwide. And its mission has been to, quote, to create a movement of God's men who are empowered to lead others, lead others on a meaningful journey into personal character and leadership ultimately having a positive impact on generations of women, children, and families. Essentially, y'all, they're building up godly men. Yeah. That's what their mission is. And they do this by churching men and by creating intentional church-to-church -church movements of men's ministry, which encourage men to be involved in small groups and leader development pathways. All so that the men can grow spiritually in the Lord. I don't think I have to tell you guys how important that work is, saints of God, especially in the world right now. So this work that uh, Every Man Ministries, or as we're going to call them today, EMM, for lack of, uh, or to save time, this work that they're doing is inspirational in scope to all of us as believers, or at least it should be. When you look at what they're doing, now they were founded and they are led by our friend, our brother, Mr. Kenny Luck. And in, in addition to being the founder and president of EMM, Mr. Luck also currently is the leadership pastor at Crossline Church in Laguna Hills, California. And prior to that, he was the men's pastor at Saddleback Church in Lake Forest, California from 1997. To 2004. So he has an extensive history in shepherding others, particularly men and ministerial work. And EMM is known for its interactive events with the community, namely its yearly Dangerous Good Men's Conference, which this year gets underway on August 27th at Celebration Church in Georgetown, Texas. So he's here 
to talk about all that good stuff <laughs> and tell you more about dangerous good. And that he, my friend, is our special guest and our new friend of the show. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Kenny Luck, president and founder of Every Man Ministries. Mr. Luck, how are you, sir? That's good. I recorded this Zoom call too, Adrian, and <laughs> I'm going to use it now for all of my introductions. You are you are world class, bro. Thank you so much. It's awesome just to have you as my new friend and to be talking about this important subject. Absolutely, man. We greatly appreciate you. And it is an important subject and it's some very important work that you're doing that we're going to get to. So before we get there, let yeah. our audience know a bit about you, Great. your personal history and background. How did you even get into ministry? Yeah, um, well, I, I received Christ uh, in the back bedroom of my parents' house in mm. uh, 1982. And three months later, I stepped on the campus at UCLA as an incoming freshman here in L.A. And that first week, I put my name down for a Bible study just to be a part of a Bible study. I really didn't know what I was doing. And a dude named Matt Booker knocked on my door at Hedrick Hall. And that was my first Bible study. It was a group of guys. We got together every week. But I didn't know that I was a part of a disciple-making ministry wow. called Campus Crusade. And so I never went without Bible study for one week for all four years of my life. Um, I was discipled myself, and I was taught how to make disciples who make disciples. So kind of right from the get-go, Adrian, uh, wherever I've been, whatever my vocation has been, whether that's uh, a missionary in the Eastern Bloc in the 80s or a CEO of a healthcare company or a lead pastor, I've always been connected to discipleship and um, evangelism. So it's sort of like I cut my teeth right out of the box mm. as a new Christian in disciple making and just by seeing the impact. Um, and, you know, Jesus, Jesus is our model, right? Three years, 12 guys, 20 centuries of uh, movement, not a bad example to follow. Yeah. And, uh, and so that's how I got started in ministry. It's just right after I became a Christian, uh, I was brought into a one-on-one -re -one relationship uh, with a mature believer who, who taught me God's word, who taught me how to pray, who mentored me, who modeled for me, and who, me who messaged me about what God's plan for my life was. And he planted vision in my chest that one day I would be doing what he was doing with me with other people. Amen. And, and praise God that you had someone to mentor you like that. If we all had mentors like that, or specifically, if there were more young people within the kingdom who had individuals, mentors like that, yeah. we would see the rate of young people staying in the church as opposed to leaving in droves. But we're going to save that conversation for another day. Brother. All right. Um, Tell us a bit, based on that background and the love that you developed for evangelism and for discipleship and for studying the word of God, yeah. how did that lead you to fund EMM? Yeah, at the time uh, I founded EMM, I was the CEO of a healthcare company with about 600 employees. I was very busy. I had left the mission field in full-time ministry. I got involved in a healthcare startup. So I was in the marketplace. But like I said before, wherever I was, I was always serving the mission and vision of my, my local pastor. And that meant for me making disciples uh, and producing leaders that could support the mission and vision of the local church. And so that's all I was doing. I started with two tables of eight guys uh, in 1997. And that grew within just a couple of years to 53 tables of 800 men that started meeting on a weekly basis. And so just kind of backing into it was like, wow, there is a hunger, number one, in the hearts of men. It's not like men don't want to grow spiritually. It's not like men don't want to connect. It's not like men don't want to have a vision for for influence and impact and to be great and do great things in Christ. It's just that they were looking for a space where they could own it themselves. Cause a lot of time, and we know this, and I'm sure a lot of your viewers know it too, that many times, you know, uh, men are taking their cues from the women in their life. 
They feel like um, the church is a place where, where women are, are more than involved. And so they look at church and they look at, at, at their journey with guys like, well, I have to get my juice somewhere else. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm going to be great somewhat in some other way. They don't see that the vision for greatness is found in Christ just because they, they don't have a lot of spaces in the church where they can. It's really their own. And when you look across the church worldwide, there's not a lot of investment with men. We have kids pastors. We have robust children's ministries. We have huge student ministries, but if we were to kind of do a satellite image of staff profiles, you wouldn't find many men's pastors, which puzzles me as a pastor and as a follower of Jesus, because what was Jesus's strategy to win the world? Reach, recruit, relate to, and reproduce followers among the men that he was with. I mean, we name our kids Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we name our dogs Brutus, Nero, and Caesar. I mean, we look at the, how Jesus did it in his method, and, and there it's just the way it was, was men. And yeah. so, you know, we kind of get a feel for the spiritual battle that's happening, even in the church. It's almost like you can tell who the devil is attacking mm -hmm. by who's missing Yeah, in the church. That's why I wrote the book Sleeping Giant a little while back. You know, there's 700 million men in the world who claim the name of Jesus. but you know, we don't feel the impact of that number with activated spirit empowered living in communities and families and in countries. And so, you know, I started every man because I saw the impact. Um, I saw that when a child came to faith, a certain percentage of the family would follow. When the mom came to faith, a larger percentage would follow. But if a man came to faith, Nine out of 10, 90, over 90% of the family would, would convert. They would, they would place their face and follow the man. So that's not uh, an opinion. It's not a feeling. It's not because I'm a chauvinist. It's because those are the facts that when a man gives his life to Christ, uh, the family follows. And so I thought to myself, man, where is this in the church and who's doing it? So I started about looking around. I'm like, all right, well, I have a laboratory here at Saddleback Church. You know, and I thought, why don't I just keep volunteering? And that's when I fired myself as a CEO and invested my severance and started Everyman Ministries in 2000. And today, you know, we've got 13,000 guys every week live on Thursdays. We have 150,000 guys downloading our podcast every month. We have the largest digital platform because I feel like we need to invest in meaningful content that streams out to men that shows them uh, how to be God's man. And, and now, as you mentioned, we want to do city transformation initiatives where uh, men across a city gather, connect, worship, receive a prophetic word, and then they get together in community and then they go out and serve uh, their community all at once in one week in a dangerous good servolution. So this is a, this is a passion of mine, but that's sort of how Men's uh, EMM got started and, 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 and how it's progressed. What a fantastic story. And you hit on a lot of great points with respect to that background. The main one being the galvanization of men and or galvanization of men and their willingness and ability to come together so joyfully. Um, yeah. The world has its own definitions of what constitutes being a man. Right. And when we're followers of Christ, we have our own standpoint, you know, That's from right. a worldly standpoint and their worldly definitions about what a man is. Uh, you know, real men don't cry. Real men do right. this. And that type of definitions. We right. know from a believer standpoint right. that Jesus was the epitome yes. of what it meant to be a mature That's man. Right. Um, explain from a practical, applicable standpoint how EMM advocates that sensibility um, to the men that are that come to your um, to your events and to the men that you minister to. Yeah. Um, well, you 
you, you, you hit it on the head. Uh, Jesus is the model for the worldwide dangerous good movement. He is the epitome of a man. He was tough. He was tender. He was servant oriented. He was sacrificial. He was compassionate. He was courageous. You know, and, and to put it in a cultural perspective, you know, when when you hear out there things like toxic masculinity mm. uh, and what they're talking about is they're talking about strength without character and compassion. Right. So if you have strength, power, influence, um, platform, uh, power, um, but you don't have character and you don't have compassion guiding that strength, you'll abuse people. You'll you'll cause suffering for women and children. And that's kind of what we see uh, in the news. And we would call that in uh, in a sociological term, an alpha male, you know, where it's just all strength, no compassion, no character. But then on the other side of the coin, culturally, we had the, the rise of feminism in the 60s and 70s and 80s and even through to now. And there was a good basis uh, for that because of the suffering that was inflicted on women through broken male culture. And so we have a rise of intellectual independence, financial independence, um, uh, relational independence from, from men. But then the pendulum swung too far. And this is what happened in male culture. It's just like, well, I don't know whether I need to open a door for a woman now. Can I be strong now? Can I? And so as my friend at Stanford University, Philip Zimbardo, he wrote the book called The Demise of Guys. The rise of feminism created a retreat from male strength and produced what I call omega male. So there's alpha male who has a lot of strength and no character. Then there's Omega male and he's, he's got a lot of compassion and character, but he doesn't have strengths. Mm. And so when you take alpha and Omega and you put it into one person, who do you get? Jesus. Come on now. You get Jesus. And so, yeah. you know, that's who we're looking for. That's the, in the world that Jesus walked in and, and your listeners and your viewers have to get this. He walked into a world that was exactly like ours. It was full of political tension. It was full of racial tension. It was full of gender war. It was, it was, it was, it was just like ours. But you watch Jesus walk and be a man in that culture where the mentality among his buddies or, 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 or Jewish men was, thank God I'm not a woman. Thank God I'm not a kid. Thank God I'm not one of those Gentiles. Right. What did Jesus do? He protected and defended women. He called the children forward. He touched them and blessed them. And he told parables about the good Samaritan. Oops. You know, and so we see Jesus enter broken male culture. And that's that's true around the world. I'm Pacific Islander. Um, I'm Guamanian. We have our own kind of male culture. There's black mm -hmm. male culture, white male culture, Brazilian male culture, African male culture. There's all these male cultures that, that don't have Christ at the center of it. And there's a way to be and believe and behave in that culture that's modeled, right? right. Jesus comes into his culture, which is operating a certain way, and he totally turns it on its head. And he's drawing attention. It's attractive. Why? Because he's strong and he has character and he has compassion and people were waiting for a guy like this. And that's why people started to follow him. But, you know, as he did that, it threatened the existing male culture that it was exposing. Mm -hmm. Right. When you read the Gospels and you see, you know, insecure Pharisees and religious people, men get you know attacking jesus it's because man he's showing him what a real man really is you yeah. know and he's he's breaking all the rules he's 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 touching the ethnically unacceptable the morally unacceptable you know the physically unacceptable he's just and and he's he's god's man and so when we talk about the model for manhood how do we train men um you have to hold up jesus as the model man, he's alpha and omega. He's tough. He went to the cross, man, but he's tender. He reached out and he touched the leper. He's sacrificial, but he's servant oriented. He said, the greatest person among you is going to be your servant, right? He's courageous. 
he stands for his convictions and for the word of God, but he's also compassionate to those who feel marginalized. And so we just point people to Jesus. And Jesus was the man who was originally dangerous with goodness. I mean, he's the guy we want to be. We spend billions on the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Star Wars, all these fantasy stories as men, because we want to we want to be a part or touch greatness and and see evil defeated and have special powers and that's it fellas it's all in jesus yes, sir. you start a relationship with jesus you're going to start doing great things you're going to start becoming great because you're going to start becoming like christ and so in the dangerous good movement we hold up jesus as the model and no one feared him being strong because he blessed people mm-hmm. with his strengths and character and compassion. Amen. Amen. And that is the ultimate, that is the pen ultimate example of what it means yes. to be a godly man. Now, when we talk about the word of God and how it empowers yeah. men, there I think the perfect verse for that would be 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses yeah. 13 and 14. I'm yeah. going to read that, folks. Yeah. That is be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith, be men of courage, be strong, do everything in love. So according to that text, a true man is vigilant against danger. That's right. Faithful to the truth. That's right. He's brave in the face of opposition. Right. He's persistent through trials. And above all else, he's a loving man. Yes. So. Can you explain for our audience just exactly why that passage of text so effectively speaks to what EMM espouses in its ministerial work? Yeah, I love that passage because it 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 communicates that there needs to be a sobriety uh, that and a soberness to your purpose here mm-hmm. on earth, that there's a battle. Uh, you know, God's man is aware that there's a spiritual battle and there's a lot at stake. There's souls at stake. There's women and children at stake. Um, and we're supposed to have that kind of battlefield awareness in the spaces and places where we are. We're kingdom men. We're not like regular men. We belong to the kingdom. Our, our, our job is to advance the kingdom. And if you're a kingdom guy, you know that earth is war. Heaven's later. Earth is war. That's what Jesus said. He said, in this world, you're going to have tribulation, but take heart. I've overcome the world. He pointed out that there's a real devil, just like there's a real Jesus. There's a real devil. And there's a there's kingdoms in conflict. But Jesus said, I've given you the keys of the kingdom. And what you bind on, on, on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You can step into your spiritual authority through your identity in Christ yeah. and take territory as a kingdom man. But you got to be mindful you got to be aware of who you are what your identity is and what your role is in the spaces and places so be on the alert stand firm in the faith i love like teaching by contrast stand firm versus what right mm. you know uh be wishy-washy in your faith be inconsistent in your right. faith you know right. and when i see that word firm You know, a real man of God is firm in his beliefs and convictions. You mentioned that word, convictions, right? And it goes to spiritual integrity, right? When you're firm in the faith, you have spiritual integrity. It means that you're undivided between what you believe Mm -hmm. and how you live and think. Right. Right? You're undivided, you know? And that's where it's really confusing to the women in our lives, the children in our lives, to the community when we say, I'm a follower of Jesus. And I believe in loving God and loving people, but I'm divided between what I believe and how I actually think and live. And that gospel is a living gospel. Sometimes you're the only gospel that people are going to read. And what are they looking for? Integrity. They just want to see that you're the real deal. So stand firm in the faith. Act like men. It it just reminds me of when Paul said, when I was a child, I I talked like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. This is another confusing thing, Adrian, in the culture. We have 25-year-old, 12-year-olds. 
We have yeah. 35 year old, 13 year olds, 45 year old, and so on, where you have men who have man sized responsibilities, families, babies, you know, jobs, but they have boy sized character. Wow. And it, it, it's sad. Um, you know, and people look to a man who has a man sized body and man sized responsibility to have a man sized maturity. Absolutely. Right? It goes to maturity. They haven't put their childish ways behind them. And a lot of times it goes to uh, what we talked about at the top, which is there's no uh, models for them. There's no mentors and there's nobody messaging to them what it means to be a man. And the, the, the first stop for that is the family. Yeah. The first stop is the family. That's God's first community of acceptance. So when the family disintegrates, then what are we left with? Men will connect somewhere. They'll look for an identity somewhere. They'll look for a model somewhere. It and will. a lot of times they look to the unhealthy worldly models and mentors out there and, uh, and, and they suffer the consequences. And, and so do others. Then the last part of it is let all you, all you do be done in love. You know, when you read the Bible, you know, you have, you have expressions of love, but Jesus was clear. The kind that makes a difference is sacrificial love. Mm -hmm. Greater love has no one than this. And so right. people know you're a man when you're able to say no to yourself and say yes to other people, just yeah. like Jesus did. That's a real man. So that's, that's, that's what's, what, why this verse is so great. And that's what every man teaches, you know, and the dangerous good movement is it's not, Jesus did not, um, you know, he didn't model the right type of manhood because, you know, he was blending in and being nice or hiding his strength. He, he loved God and loved people aggressively Yeah, in the spaces okay. and places where he was. And he said no to himself to say yes to other people. He said no to culture to say, to say yes to God's word when it required it. And so people want that people need that. And that's why we have to have um, movements all over the world, not just the dangerous good movement, but movements all over the world that target men that share the gospel with men that um, where men receive the gift of salvation and the gift of Holy spirit implantation so that God's intention for them to become like Christ is realized, and then people around them are blessed. Benevolent Faith is excited to announce our brand new relationship with the mobile app known as Wisdom App, where you have conversations that matter. Wisdom App is a new mobile app that gives you access to expert help when you need it most. When you download the app, it allows you to listen in real time and ask questions to experts in almost every area of life. From business and finance to fitness and fashion. From sports-based conversations to faith-based faith dialogue. So check out Benevolent Faith's new chat platform on the Wisdom app. It's called Speak On It, the Believer's Q&A where we welcome you to ask questions directly about things related to the Bible and faith in Christ. We'll drop the topic and you come and speak about it. Download the Wisdom app in the Apple and Android store today and search for at Rev Rob. Church family, I pray that you are uplifted by those words. If you would like to find out more about today's pastor and listen to his full sermon, simply click the link. Remember to follow us on social media to keep up with more great sermons and messages we broadcast throughout the day, week, and month. I'm Megan Reed with the Daily Gospel Network. And until next time, remember, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me.